I have to start with a confession. I'm a hopeless dancer, which doesn't bode so well for a talk on the quality assurance of digital teaching and learning in which I'm going to be using the metaphor of dancing. Nonetheless, let's see if it works. Firstly, quality or quality assurance is a bit like shadow dancing. It's an elusive concept. Different people have different meanings and interpretations. It's very hard to pin down. On the other hand, when done really poorly, it can be a bit like line dancing, where everyone ticks the box, does exactly the same, and they're just following compliance and very, very limited steps. On the other hand, again, it could be more like a mob dance where um, everyone comes together with great enthusiasm. Digital teaching and learning is highly topical. There's a spontaneity and an enthusiasm. But what we also know is it kind of dissipates quite quickly and everyone goes back in the end to what they were doing in their regular jobs and lives. Well, let's see if you can think of some other metaphors that help from a dance perspective that work for quality assurance. In the meantime, I'm going to have three parts of this talk that will be a very quick overview of some work that I've been doing in this area. Firstly, I'm going to talk about a OECD study that we published last year based on some research conducted over almost a year. Then I'm going to talk about some insights from work that we've done this year for the OECD on quality assurance of micro-credentials. And lastly, I'm going to talk about some insights from the Irish National Quality Assurance Guidelines that I've been leading with our National Quality Assurance Agency. To extend the metaphor a little, at risk of overextending it, any kind of dancing is better than no dancing at all. So perhaps you might want to take me to task on this, but at least some form of quality assurance is likely to be better than nothing. There are three nonetheless underlying assumptions that I want to qualify that statement with. Firstly, quality concerns when it comes to online forms of learning or digital forms of learning are not new. And there have been many efforts over more than two decades to develop quality frameworks of one kind or another. Secondly, delivery mode alone is not a key factor in determining quality. There's a substantial amount of comparative research that so shows that online in particular forms of delivery can be just as good, if not better than traditional campus-based learning. What matters is the design, not the delivery mode. And then lastly, we have a bit of a problem around language and, and what terminology we use here. It's important, but definition wars are largely unproductive when it comes to what we're trying to describe. And I'll elaborate a little bit using this relatively recent article talking about confusion in terms that makes a very helpful, I think, distinction between the location in which the learner is whether they're on campus or off campus, on site or off site. And that location is a really important determinant for the delivery mode. Lastly, before I get started, just some framing principles that I hope um, for those of you who are very familiar with quality assurance, and these resonate from the contemporary literature. I won't read out um, the kind of guiding principles there or framing principles, but it is important to acknowledge that when it comes to quality assurance, there are inputs, processes, resources, and usually it's the outputs that are quite weak. And that's certainly um, our evidence in digital teaching and learning. And these um, need to all be thought about from a macro level right down to the nano level of the learner. Macro being, if you like, at the European or national level and the institutional level um, in the middle. So without further ado, let me start and share some insights from this OECD study published last year with a formal launch actually in March of this year. Um, there were three parts to the study. Firstly, we wanted to see what external quality assurance agencies in particular were doing in response to digital higher education. That's the language we used. 
Um, then we looked at what institutions were doing in response to quality assurance of digital higher education. And then the third part looked at the kind of support to enhance our high quality student experience. I'll talk about mainly the first two parts of the study. So in terms of national and regional quality assurance agencies, um, what we found was that 23 um, countries and OECD jurisdictions had done nothing to respond to new and emerging um, quality considerations in response to digital education. Um, now, whether that was intentional or whether they had not simply got to it and they planned to is somewhat speculative. But we did find that there were eight OECD jurisdictions in which a intentional decision had been made to use the existing common standards and guidelines for quality assurance for digital higher education. So that they would simply, in some cases, slightly extend them, but generally just accepting that what we already have is quality standards, regardless of the mode of delivery and the type of technology. And one example I think that's very interesting is Australia. And why this example is interesting is because not only did we see that they've um, just integrated or embedded their existing standards, but the National Quality Assurance Agency, TESCA, has actually gone beyond that and adopted more of a partnership enabling model working with institutions to the point of even developing a good practice guide by the sector for the sector, not from the national agency, but working with the sector. So this partnership model was something that we identified as a, chain, a change from more of a compliance and monitoring approach at the external level. It's actually quite similar to QAA in the United Kingdom, where they've developed this toolkit for enhancing quality in a digital environment, supporting institutions helping them to take responsibility for quality and scaffolding what it is that they need to be looking at. So those are two interesting examples. The third category, we found 12 countries or jurisdictions in which um, specific guidelines or standards have been developed for digital higher education in addition to what already exists. Um, and so let me give you a, an example. You may be familiar with this one from Malta. It's very much a response to online learning and concerns in the sort of post-COVID environment. These were published in 2021. You can see they have eight domains from leadership through the curriculum design. And it just so happens that Ireland in 2018 launched the statutory quality assurance guidelines for blended learning programs. I was actually involved in these programs. Unlike the ones for Malta, which are generic, these are based on three different contexts or layers. You can see there the organizational context, the program context, and the learner experience context. So they kind of have a richness to them that is quite unusual compared to some of the other uh, frameworks that exist. And I'll come back to these uh, later because they're currently being revised, the third part of my talk. Moving to the institutional level, there are just dozens of different frameworks and guidelines and toolkits available for institutions. I was involved in this, in looking at the um, green image there in this report published in 2021 by the European Universities Association in, as part of the DigiHE project, where we reviewed 20 of these different better known frameworks. Um, I won't go through all of them here. You could read about them in your own time if you're not familiar with them. They do share some similarities, but some important differences. For example, the embed European maturity model for blended education similarly is based on three different levels, a course level, a program level, and an institution level. Um, I was also involved in the development of those with the European Association for Distance Teaching Universities. Um, what we did with the OCD study is we synthesized the main domains across uh, about a dozen of the better known frameworks and this is what we found in terms of commonalities 
Uh, and the ones that are most uh, less likely as well as most common. So you can see that learning design and course delivery is the most common, but notably assessment and feedback practices. Now, if we think about uh, the impact of AI, um, this is very, very much uh, underdone, if you like, in the sense of the profile that's being placed on those in the frameworks that institutions can currently use. And similarly, learning outcomes, remember I said outcomes are really important, outcomes, focus on equity, diversity, inclusion, are uh, very much um, under the radar, you could say. Actually, there has been work already that has done a meta-analysis of over 112 publications looking at quality assurance of online education, recognizing that another meta-analysis actually found 46 different definitions of online education alone. So even um, that term online education is far more problematic than we might appreciate. Some of the findings is that um, confirming that there are an abundance of frameworks, there are many shared dimensions, as I showed you in the last slide, um, an absence of an output on uh, output measures, which is not uh, surprising, um, that there is an emergence of new quality considerations, and I'm going to pick up on those shortly, and that far more research is needed on how institutions actually use these various tools and frameworks. We know very little in that regard. Um, in actual fact, um, I was involved with this study again with the European Universities Association, where a survey of over 350 institutions, European institutions, found that only 12% said that their institution had used any kind of self-assessment or benchmarking tool for digital forms of teaching and learning. My own institution is one that has done this. We've done an institutional thematic review of digital learning, including a, a self-review and then an external panel coming. The report from that is a publicly available document on our website. The only really thorough study that's looked at what an institution has done in utilizing one of these tools that happens to be Quality Matters, one of the most well-known tools out of the United States, um, identified some very interesting aspects that, in fact, the design of the tool was far less important than the institutional culture and the way in which people interpret these tools and implement them. So the same tool may be implemented in very different ways by different institutions. So this is a very good study to look at on the influence that organizational culture and the context makes to the tools and helps us realize that we need to work with institutions in helping them learn how to make better use of the tools and frameworks that we develop for quality assurance. Lastly, for this part, um, here are just some of the gaps that we identified from a quality assurance perspective. Uh, Micro-credentials are circled. Um, the application of artificial intelligence is circled, but less from a focus on technology or new developments, uh, none of the frameworks focus on academic workload models, a critical part of determining how academic staff engage with new delivery approaches and new technologies. Similarly, uh, just to pick one other, um, in the post-COVID environment, we've learned a lot about the importance of digital well-being. And that's something from a student or learner experience that's absent from existing frameworks. So that's a kind of quick gap analysis. I want to now um, move on to give you a sense of um, the second study that built on this report and the key principles that we published in the report for quality assurance of digital higher education. You can see the eight principles there. And we asked ourselves actually only from the middle of January, this work began and was completed at the end of, Jan uh, end of March, how do quality assurance principles, as you can see them there in the report, apply to micro-credentials, given that so many micro-credentials are enabled through some digital form. So in an extending the study, the assumption firstly is that micro-credentials are one of the big topics right now, big developments, as confirmed through this OECD study published in March, 
showing the growth of micro-credentials amongst MOOC providers. Here, of course, interestingly, there can sometimes be no institution involved. No, uh, might be done through the MOOC partner and a industry partner with them. But what we also know is that the institutional level from the survey uh, conducted, uh, published in March of this year, building on a previous survey, is that micro-credentials continue to remain a key part of institutional strategies for the future. The same survey also found that quality assurance was the major barrier um, or perceived to be the major barrier in terms of recognition and uh, implementation of micro-credentials. So that makes this study very relevant. Um, we're not starting from scratch in the European context. Um, here's a work that was done as part of the Microvolve project, done in 2020, published in 2021. At the time, only two countries explicitly mentioned micro-credentials as part of their quality assurance system, Ireland being one of those. Um, last year, INQA led a very, very high-profile working group on micro-credentials, and um, here's some of the results from a survey of 64 different um, organizations, sorry, 53 um, different agencies and organizations. You can see that only 15% of them say that they currently quality assure micro-credentials, and similarly over 50% uh, report that they don't really expect to start the quality assurance of micro-credentials in the near future. Um, that may have changed because this work was collected almost a year ago. It'll be interesting to see a repeat, a follow-up of that. Then what we did in this OCD study is we similarly looked at what national and regional quality assurance agencies are doing, and we found that 25 countries have really done nothing in response to additional uh, standards or guidelines for micro-credentials over and above what they already have. Six countries um, with several different agencies in both Canada and Spain um, to add to the mix have developed um, uh, initiatives in which they've made a conscious decision to use the common standards that already apply and apply those to micro-credentials with some extension in some situations or circumstances. Um, here's an example from Europe. Um, you hopefully can elaborate um, on what's really going on in Estonia, but certainly there is some work there. Um, in Spain, there has been quite a major initiative to align micro-credentials into European standards and guidelines. And actually, after our OECD research, Germany launched this report, which also indicates alignment to European standards and guidelines, but also leaves the door open for developing additional quality assurance standards. And this third category, there are only three countries that have already developed um, specific standards and quality assurance processes for micro-credentials. One of those is New Zealand, my country of birth, Malaysia, and also Ireland. Here's, um, you can see Malaysia. Malaysia probably is the best example of very, very um, aligned set of guidelines for micro-credentials with their national guidelines for degree pro level programs. Um, actually, what's interesting, the United Kingdom which has also got an initiative um, that's a voluntary initiative by the British Accreditation Council, not their National Quality Assurance Agency, but it's a voluntary initiative for institutions to um, submit and have their micro-credentials accredited according to um, about seven or eight standards. I think you can see them there. So that's an interesting voluntary initiative. Um, I want to now shift quickly to what's happening at the institutional level. And to do this research, we adopted a, a methodology where there are three countries that have national portals or national or regional initiatives. The first is actually a regional initiative from Ontario in Canada, where there are in this portal almost 1,800 micro-credentials from dozens of different providers. So what we did is every provider that was listed we then use the methodology to look to see to what extent they say what they're doing around micro-credential quality assurance. Actually, what we found for Canada in the case of Ontario is not a single institution had anything publicly available about what it was doing in this area. 
In the case of Australia, the new microcred Seeker portal, national portal launched earlier in the year. Um, similarly, we used the same methodology. What's interesting to note here, just as I hope you saw with the Ontario um, portal, 88% in the case of Ontario of their micro credentials are online. Here it's 93% of them are online. Um, and what we found in Australia was a lot more maturity at the institutional level. Um, here's an example of Charles Sturt University with its own framework for short courses and micro credentials, definitions, and quite robust uh, quality assurance processes. Uh, not the only institution, a dozen or so uh, Australian universities had quite good data around how to support quality assurance. The rest, nothing available. And then the third case study, if you like, is Ireland, where a recently launched portal, um, the microcreds portal, um, with seven Irish universities and now around 250 microcredentials on offer, we looked at um, what each of the institutions were doing for quality assurance. Note here that about 50% of the micro-credentials are fully online and most of the others or all of the others in a blended form. Well, we only found one institution that had anything publicly available to say what it was doing around the quality assurance of micro-credentials. This was Trinity College Dublin, so not even my own institution. You can see a sort of flow chart there of how they are addressing quality assurance. So there's a really quite large gap at the institutional level in at least what's being said publicly. To summarize some of the gaps, um, there's many things that could be taken into account um, that are not currently. Uh, I'll just single out a couple of things at this point in time. Institutional leadership and organizational structures, they just don't get any consideration from a quality assurance perspective around micro-credentials. I have a journal article about that coming out in any day, um, and probably in this week, I imagine that will be out if you want to follow up and get a copy of it. Um, from an implementation point of view, the disclosure to learners about their readiness for success and what the micro-credential will involve, particularly with it being online. If I've never studied online as a learner, I would want to know the availability of learning support and library resources. This is a huge gap. Those portals that I shared with you have nothing in response to, to those particular quality um, considerations. And then from a monitoring and outputs perspective, there's a huge data desert when it comes to student experience data, employer satisfaction data, let alone graduate employment data um, and the like. So these are large gaps um, that might make the case for why additional quality concern, assurance considerations may be required for the growth of micro-credentials. Lastly, very quickly, what we're doing here in Ireland, I said before that we have these existing guidelines and we've been involved in developing these new statutory quality assurance guidelines for providers of programs supported by digital education, namely blended, hybrid and online programs, including micro-credentials. Let me give you a taste of some of what we've done, but uh, we've gone through a public consultation process. We're actually in the third round, the final round of that now. Here's just what some of the sector told us was important to them. You can see assessment stands out um, as well as support and additional definitions. Um, here's an insight into the particular report, the latest one that we've produced. Um, Definition-wise, we've actually just drawn on the definitions of digital higher education that the OECD produced, which then as an umbrella concept includes online, hybrid, and blended forms of learning. Um, we've continued to adopt these three contexts, the organizational context, the program context, and the learner experience context, but we've developed particularly the learner experience context far more than what existed under the previous blended learning guidelines. Let me give you some insight by um, examples of what we've done, but you will also see that we've given guidance on how to apply the guidelines, which was a gap that we identified in the literature currently. 
So for each guideline, here's the organizational context one. We begin with a scoping statement. And then for the domain within that guideline, and there are several domains under each guideline, under each context, um, sorry, there's a good practice statement. And then you can see in relation to that, uh, a number of statements around what good practice is supported and reflected by. Here's an example of how we've addressed online delivery um, within the guidelines rather than separately. And this one refers to where staff must either demonstrate experience of teaching online or participate in appropriate induction training and professional development for online delivery um, under a, the domain of staff training and professional development and institutional support. Uh, learners outside of Ireland, this is a really big consideration for fully online programs, but also for micro-credentials where national borders um, really don't come into play. In particular, one of the big considerations from a QA perspective is the legal, statutory and reg reg regulatory requirements of where the learner resides, which may be very different from um, your own context, including whether they have full access to the internet, in fact without any form of censorship or um, the level of access is adequate. Program context here, again, a scoping statement, good practice statement for the first domain. Uh, you can see how online is addressed around um, lead learners needing to be able to complete all of their study online. Um, here's an example of um, learning and curriculum design. Um, the importance of the purposeful consideration of synchronous and asynchronous, particularly for fully online delivery. Um, learner experience context, the third level scoping statement there. Um, thinking about study, the good practice statement. Let me share one last um, example. This is the domain around learning support and development because this was one of the biggest gaps that I mentioned for micro-credentials, but more generally, the one that starred there for fully online programs about the equivalency of provision of learning support and development services. For example, do online learners have access to their math center, the writing center, all of the resources available through the library and so forth. This is an issue in the case of micro-credentials that is a huge gap in all of those three portals that I shared with you. So um, here's a bit of a summary of what we found and tried to address in the Irish um, new guidelines when it comes to micro-credentials in an integrated way, given so many of them use digital technologies for either fully online or blended delivery. I won't reiterate what I've already said, I'm conscious of time. So just to summarize a few final remarks, yes, European standards and guidelines are important. Um, to what extent we need to revise those guidelines. In the OECD report, we gave some examples of what could be revised. Um, there are these various frameworks that already exist for institutions to choose and in many respects adopt perhaps a pick and mix approach because context is very important in benchmarking and developing a culture of continuous improvement. And then in the third column, there's a question around the country specific quality frameworks and guidelines. And I guess only national agencies and countries can answer that question. Uh, in Ireland, clearly a decision has been made that there is enough uh, additional quality considerations that require topic specific guidelines, in this case, for digital education that encompass micro credentials. I guess this will be uh, a factor of, for some discussion and consideration in Estonia. And I look forward to hearing how um, those conversations play out. Final sort of remark back to, I guess, the dancing metaphor. The problem is not really making up the new dance steps, but deciding which ones to keep and combine to help make a great performance. Maybe performance isn't the right word, a great experience rather than shackling our dancers, as you can see in the image there, with a set of quality assurance guidelines that are very much coming from a compliance perspective. That would be the worst thing that we can do. I'll stop on that note. A few references that I've mentioned, um, a relatively recent book chapter that's well worth looking at in the European context. And hopefully my talk will trigger 
some useful questions and conversations over the course of your event and beyond, please do not hesitate to contact me if you want uh, to have more information or a follow-up to anything that I've mentioned. Thank you very much. Um, I've uh, enjoyed the opportunity to contribute, albeit sadly not live on this occasion, perhaps another time. Cheers. <laughs>